Welcome to Seller Mobile TV. I have got a very special guest with me here today. Um, she is the queen of sourcing from Asia and we're so lucky to have you, so happy to have you here. I know it took a little bit of finagling of our schedules. It is nighttime for me, as you can tell, it's really dark in this room, um, And but I'm really glad that we made it happen because, um, you know, um, when we think of sourcing, we often think about China, right? That's the first thing that comes to our mind. And, um, and that's not sort of the end all to the story. There's a lot more to it. And that's exactly why you're here. You're here to talk to us about other options, widening our horizons a little bit, giving us just some more things, more options um, to have on our table. Um, you know, one of the things that I really like to do is, I mean, I know that we provide, you know, Seller Mobile, we provide a software to our customers, um, but we like to have a really close relationship with our customers as well. Um, and so, so many of them recently, especially because of the whole coronavirus, um, which has, you know, disturbed your supply chain, um, you know, have come to us with concerns and kind of questions um, about maybe having another option. And so um, today, Megla, you are going to talk to us about um, sourcing from India. Um, now you have, a t I mean, decades worth of experience, which I know I'm dating you a little bit, but you can't buy that kind of experience. And so, um, so we're so, uh, we're just so happy to have you here to talk to us about sourcing from India, what that looks like. Um, and, uh, um, and so I'll let, let you kind of start and take it away. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Hiba, for inviting me and having me here. I'm super excited uh, to be presenting to your audience. And I think you're, you're absolutely right, Hiba. You know, there is no other country, I think, that can replace China as of now when it comes to sourcing products, because China is just such a well-oiled machine. But at the same time, I think it's really important for people to look at other countries, whether it's India, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Mexico, US, wherever, to diversify their risk and diversify their sourcing so that they are not putting all their eggs in one basket. Right. So, and I think India is one of the strongest competitors to China um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, they do have a lot of exports already happening from India and uh, you know, the, they have a large worker population as well. Um, labor costs are lower. So I think India has a lot of advantages in terms of uh, uh, production. So what I'm going to do is I've got some slides over here and I'm going to share my screen and I'll just walk people through the slides. And, and Hiba, if you have any questions, you can just uh, stop me along the way and at any time. So can you, he can you see my yeah, slides? Yeah, I can see your screen. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so uh, these are the topics that I want to cover today. So first of all, I want to uh, tell you people why you should consider sourcing from India, what kinds of products can be sourced, some tips for effective sourcing, and then how you can get started. All right, so uh, just a little bit of background about myself. So I've been working in the sourcing industry for almost 20 years. Yes, I'm very old. <laughs> and uh, I worked in uh, India for a couple of years, and then I was in the Philippines. I lived in China for almost 10 years, and then I'm currently based in Singapore. So most of my career, I worked with a company called Global Sources, which is a B2B sourcing platform. And I worked closely with suppliers as well as buyers, trying to understand <clears throat> what their needs are in terms of sourcing. Um, I've also worked on a lot of manufacturing research reports uh, during my time in China and visited a lot of factories and sourcing trade shows and you know, did a lot of in-depth research into how manufacturing and production and exports happen. Uh, so last year I started my own company and I started the sourcing trip to India called uh, India Sourcing Trip and uh, I'm also selling on Amazon myself. So that's a bit of background. Um, and sourcing is my thing. I mean, that's what I really specialize in. I've been talking about how to source from China, India, how to find suppliers, how to vet suppliers. That's what I've really been talking about um, on various podcasts and, um, and webinars. Okay, so why source from India? So that's the biggest question or the first question I think most people have, you know, why should they consider sourcing from a country like India? One of the reasons I think is that you'll find a lot of unique products in India that are not found in other countries. I think that's one of the biggest reasons. Um, there are a lot of um, premium high quality products that are made from natural materials like wood, metal. Um, there's a lot of leather also, uh, in terms of fabrics as well, each state in India has a very distinct style of, of fabric that they produce, whether it's in terms of the embellishments or the embroidery or the, the, the colors or the blends that they have. Each and every state has a different style. 
There are also a lot of um, you know artisans in India that have these skills for certain types of uh, processes, for example, metalworking. And these skills have been passed down from you know generation to de- generation. They've been doing it for hundreds of years. And um, now all of those skills have kind of been commercialized, you know. So it's not like they're they're doing it on a very small scale or it's you know a crafty kind of thing that's that's that they're doing over there. It's really commercialized and it's done on a on a large scale. Um, also there's a lot of natural materials that are available locally in India. So India is the second largest producer of cotton, for example. And then there's a lot of, uh, you know, metal, uh, wood, glass, a lot of the natural materials are available locally. And so that of course gives you an advantage in terms of, uh, you know, the, the prices of, uh, of the products that are available there. Another advantage, and this is specifically for Amazon sellers, um, a lot of the suppliers are willing to do low MOQs. And uh, this is mostly for products that are handmade, home decor items, but even some of the other items. Of course, maybe not for textiles or garments where they have uh, minimum orders for you know the, the fabric that they have to order from the mills. Of course, if the fabric is readily available, then maybe they can, they can do smaller orders as well. But generally for home decor items or gift items uh, that you can source from India, the, the MOQs range from 200 to 500 pieces, which is really low. I mean, if you talk to a Chinese supplier and you know ask them to f- do 500 pieces, um, they will generally not do that. And this is for customized products. You know, this is not um, just ready products that they that that are available from suppliers. Of course, there are molds costs, and you know, uh, I mean, if you're ordering smaller MOQs, then the per piece cost may be a bit higher. So you have to keep that in mind. And also the the freight may be a bit higher. But the important thing to remember is this is a possibility from India. So you can test a product. For example, if you're not sure if the product will do well on Amazon, you can order you know, as low as 50 pieces for a trial order, throw it up on Amazon, do some PPC, get some data back and see what kind of um, you know, opportunities there are for that product on Amazon. Another thing you'll find is that most of the suppliers you deal with, they speak in English. And, um, you know, India is a very large country with a lot of different states. And in fact, each and every state in the country speaks a different language. And when I say different language, it's not just, um, you know, a a dialect. It's a completely different language with a different script altogether. So, for example, I'm from the north. And if I go to the South, I do not understand what they speak. I cannot read their language. <laughs> and so English is a language that actually unites everybody, you know, in India and they, they communicate in English with each other. Of course, you know, many people don't speak English, especially maybe in the interiors or villages. They, you know, speak their local language as well. But all of the suppliers that you deal with, they are, you know, very well educated. A lot of them are second or third generation a family run businesses and the sons or daughters, they've studied overseas in the U S UK, and they've come back um, to India to manage their factories. So you'll deal with very, um, 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 you know, th- th- they speak good English and there's less chance of miscommunication and, and overall communication is much smoother. Also, you don't need translators when you go to trade shows or visit factories like you sometimes do when you do in China, of course, in China as well, you know, most, most suppliers do have uh, English speaking staff. Um, some are better at English than others. And of course, if you go to the interior provinces, you may find that uh, some of the suppliers there don't speak, uh, don't have staff that speak uh, good English. It's mostly the suppliers around the, the East Coast or, you know, near Hong Kong, where they have a lot of good English speakers. Another advantage of this specific aspect is that your contracts can be entirely in English. That is super important because when you're in China, your contracts need to be bilingual in order for them to be enforceable uh, in in court or, you know, legally uh, be valid because all the courts in China are in, are run in Chinese. So you can't really, your English contract doesn't mean anything. If there is a dispute, they will always refer to the Chinese version of the contract. Whereas in in India, all of the legal system is in English. So your contracts can be entirely in English and that's just, you know, easier for, for you. And there's just more transparency in, in terms of the uh, specific items in the contract. That's a really good point. Cause I think a lot of people wouldn't yeah. have thought that or known about that. So I think that that is a really, yeah. I mean, that's a really point. Um, yeah. 
piece there. Yeah. It's also, I find it's also easier to find lawyers in India and communicate with them. You know, sometimes uh, um, in China, I find that it's difficult to find lawyers who can speak good English, who understand trade and who understand, you know, company law. Of course, they, there are like hundreds and thousands of lawyers in China, but, you know, for a foreigner to find a good lawyer, uh, unless you know somebody or find somebody, you know, through through referral, it's kind of difficult. But in India, I find that's easier to do just because, you know, there's a lot of information available online and everything's in English. Do you also think that, I mean, so I know that we're talking specifically about Amazon sellers here, but um, do you find that in India, there are um, a lot of these manufacturers are used to working with American companies. They might be sort of bigger box companies, but they kind of have that relationship and they understand kind of what the expectation is. Again, it might not be a small Amazon seller, so this is new for uh, uh, for the folks that we work with, but um, are they just, just more well-versed in working with, um, you know, American or Western companies? Yes. So the export focused companies are, and there's a very important distinction because India is a very large country and there's a lot of domestic demand for products. So there are many suppliers or manufacturers that sell domestically that don't do exports. So those are the types of companies you need to stay away from because they don't understand how exports work, what the quality requirements are, and um, they, they don't really know how to work with exporters. But there are there's a separate set of companies that focus on exports. So if you deal with those companies, they know what your requirements are. They've dealt with you know a lot of European, especially European and, and American as well, retailers, uh, brands, importers, wholesalers, and they understand you know the requirements. They also exhibit at overseas trade shows. That's something that Indian export-focused companies really like to do. Instead of marketing their their company on you know websites like Alibaba or Global Sources, they actually prefer to exhibit at trade shows. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Yeah. Talking about this slide. So your IP is safer. And what I mean by this is, as I mentioned, there are export focused suppliers in India. So if you deal with, if you're dealing with these kinds of companies, I find that they just have a little bit more respect for your IP than, uh, you know, Chinese suppliers uh, tend to do generally. I find that Chinese suppliers, they're very quick to, uh, if they, if they see that a buyer's product is doing really well on Amazon, they don't hesitate to copy the product or just, you know, sell it under their own brand or show your design to other buyers. But I find that generally Indian suppliers are more protective um, of, of their buyer's designs. Of course, this does not mean that your design will never be compromised or, uh, you know, it's always 100% safe. There's always that risk over there. But in general, I find that they are, you'll have better protection of your design. And, um, you know, they will also put a logo on their own designs. Like if you do have, um, if you want to pick a design from their their catalog, like, you know, and you do in China, you can do that as well. Or they can customize designs for you, um, you know, as well, depending on your requirements. In fact, just a, a little story that I want to add over here. So we were talking to this one supplier that makes uh, organic cotton bed sheets. And um, we introduced the supplier to a few Amazon sellers because, you know, they were, they were, there was interest in this category. And then we'd reached out to him later and I was just talking and I asked him, hey, have you got any orders from those Amazon sellers? And he said, no, I haven't because those guys only want to do, you know, my designs that I have, um, I have done already for other buyers, but I can't share those designs with them and they have to come up with, with their own designs, you know, so that I can, uh, I, I can do my designs. So I was really impressed by That's that. That's a lot of integrity. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Because in China, they would say, yeah, sure. Here's my catalog <laughs> and, you know, just take what you want to do. <laughs> but I was really impressed by that. Um, okay. And then most Indian suppliers currently don't sell on Amazon yet. And the reason I say yet is because Amazon themselves are actually encouraging Indian manufacturers to list their products online and send, sell directly on Amazon US specifically. Um, in fact, you know, Amazon wants to cut the middleman. <laughs> They've kind of indirectly and directly said that in many, uh, many cases. However, I find that just talking to suppliers, of course, there are some people who want to sell directly. Maybe they have their own brands and they also sell domestically. Um, but most of the suppliers, they still prefer to focus on B2B and sell to business consumer, uh, business, business customers because, you know, that that's more profitable for them. They can sell in higher volumes. Uh, instead of selling piece piece by piece to B B two C, 
Another advantage, of course, is that there are no trade tariffs on Indian products, right? So that's a huge advantage. And, and specifically for products that are uh, competitively sourced in India. So for example, wooden products, you know, the, the tariffs are very high uh, on China made wooden products into the US, but in India, it's mostly around three to 4%. That's the standard tariff, sometimes even 2%, but no higher than that. And um, uh, whereas in India, there's, uh, whereas from ch China, there's, you know, the regular tariffs, plus there are Trump tariffs or trade war tariffs, right? So that's something that you won't find in India. Also, as we were talking earlier, it's always a good strategy to diversify your sourcing because as we've learned in the last few years, you know, first there was a trade war, then with this whole COVID-19 thing, the supply chain in China was disrupted earlier this year. And so, you know, people who were only dependent on China for sourcing um, were, were, you know, had, had a lot of uh, uh, trouble filling their orders and, you know, they had to, their, their listings were uh, running out of stock. So it's always a good strategy to diversify your sourcing so that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to talk about the types of products that you can source. And there are a lot many other products that are more of the industrial kind of, um, you know, in the industrial industry. And there are components like electronic components and all of those things, but I'm not going to talk about that. So these are mostly the products that I think Amazon sellers would find interesting. The biggest category I find is home decor and gift items. So these are made from metal, wood, ceramic, jute, cotton, glass. Again, more of the naturally occurring materials. Um, there's less of, you know, poly resin or synthetic materials. Those are still more competitive in China because they're manufacturing them, you know, like they're machine made and uh, mass produced in high volume. So those kinds of things are better in China. Um, there's a lot of kitchen and tableware. So these are things like uh, cutlery or dinnerware or chopping boards, you know, those kinds of things. Again, not a lot of silicone stuff. Like, uh, you know, in, in China, you'll have a lot of silicone bakeware and those kinds of things. But in India, it's more of the wood, metal, uh, marble, all of those kinds of materials. Furniture. So there's a lot of wooden furniture, upholstered uh, furniture as well. Um, and then furnishings. This is a huge category. So there's a lot of uh, bedspread, rugs, cushions, cushion covers, and a lot of different styles available. So for example, there's embroidered, there's hand tufted, there's hand embroidered, you know, there's machine embroidered and hand embroidered, which is a totally different, uh, um, you know, the, the products are very, very premium, the ones that are hand embroidered, because there are certain things that you, you can do by hand that cannot be done by machines. Um, and then there's also um, a lot of fashion products, so jewelry, accessories, footwear. In fact, leather footwear is a big category as well. And uh, for leather footwear, there's not only the regular, you know, like men's dress shoes and all, there's also specialized leather footwear um, in terms of, uh, you know, like the safe, like safety footwear that, that, it, that, are, that is used maybe in factories or um, in, in chemical plants or something like that. So very specialized, high-end um, safety footwear textiles and apparel um so there are all types of textiles and apparel but mostly cotton denim silk and wool and other naturally occurring materials but of course there is polyester and and those materials as well you'll find both knitted and woven so most of the knitted products like t-shirts socks they are uh, produced in the south of india and then uh, a lot of the woven ones are found in the north um, so that's that's, that's the kind of difference. distinction. <laughs> I'm sorry. I said that's a very interesting distinction. Sort of like it was in the north, it was in the south. But I yeah, I mean, generally that's the way. And the reason for that is, um, you know, there's a city in in South India where they've uh, set up all of these really large cotton mills, and a lot of the cotton production happens in South India. So you know that's why that area has kind of developed as a cotton production hub and then the, the government in that state really developed this city and there are like i don't know hundreds and thousands of factories there's small workshop type of factories and huge gigantic factories with you know thousand workers producing uh, all of these kinds of products organic cotton is a huge category as well so um you'll find that there's organic cotton for furnishings um apparel baby products is very popular nowadays uh, specifically on on amazon uh, and in fact, India is stronger in organic cotton than China. There are more 
GOTS certified factories in India for organic cotton than there are in China. GOTS is an organization that uh, gives certification for you know cotton, uh, organic cotton producing factories. Also, leather is a big category. So there's leather jackets, belts, shoes, handbags, and uh, the quality of leather is, is quite good. Eco-friendly products. So these are um, very innovative products that are, uh, for example, uh, disposable plates made from sugarcane waste or, you know, disposable plates and dinnerware made from areca palm leaves, which is basically a, a, a leaf of a plant, of a tree. And uh, in fact, you'll find that a lot of the companies in India are moving towards this eco-friendly kind of direction, organic and eco-friendly. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that um, the Indian government itself is trying to uh, implement more, you know, eco-friendly kind of regulations in the country. For example, a lot of cities have um, banned the use of single, single-use plastic bags. You know, those have been banned. Um, and then in Delhi, for example, if you go to McDonald's or KFC, they 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 serve wooden spoons in, instead of plastic spoons. So awesome. um, they are trying to be a little bit more eco-friendly. So I think you know the manufacturing and production is also kind of following that uh, trend. Another category that I found, found that Amazon sellers are very interested in nowadays is food items, specifically superfoods. So these are things like, um, you know, spices and herbs that are uh, positioned as immunity boosting um, in, ingredients or supplements. So for example, there's turmeric. Right, I don't know, Hiba, if you've heard of turmeric. Oh, and I, I guys... every time I have, a, I swear, I every time I have a sore throat, I do honey and turmeric, and it works wonders. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, so you know, people from India, like we've been using turmeric. Of course, we use turmeric in our food every day, but yeah, even when you get hurt or something, you know, this is something that our grandmothers used to give oh, us, absolutely. you know, turmeric and hot milk or something like that. But I think nowadays, people in the West are also. Um, you know, realizing that uh, yeah, these herbs and these spices do have some, um, uh, you know, th th they're better than all of the other synthetic um, kind of supplements. So there's high demand for that. Then there's tea and coffee and all, all sorts of other spices as well. And uh, the trend nowadays uh, that I've seen is of blends. So for example, you, you blend a couple of different spices together and each spice has a distinct um, uh, you know, property and they're used for certain things. So for example, like um, turmeric has healing properties, right? It's kind of an antibiotic as well. And then there are other spices like uh, cloves, for example, they're supposed to be good for pain relief and stuff like that. Um, there are other spices that are kind of calming. So I've seen a lot of uh, private label sellers, what they do is that they blend these, these various spices together with tea and then they sell those in in little pouches like tea bags, and they're um, they're they're marketed as you know like calming tea or <laughs> something like that. It's very interesting. Um, All right, something, so I just, I, something I didn't see on your list. I wonder is um, what about um, uh, incense or um, yeah. uh, essential oils, things like that. Yes, I'm assuming those are also yes. very popular. Um, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, there are essential oils, scented candles, um, um, incense sticks, incense okay. burners. Yeah, th that category is big too, right? So these are just some examples of the products that I just wanted to show. Um, so most of the metal products are made in the north in a city called Muradabad that is known as a metal production hub. And uh, they do a lot of copper, brass, iron, like all sorts of metal products. And they have machine made, they have hand um, you know, molded kind of products, um, and they also have laser cut uh, metal products. These are just some examples of eco friendly products. So, this rug over here is actually made from recycled PET bottles. So, this, this is a photo that I took at one of the trade shows when I was there last year. And so, what they do is basically they chop up these plastic water bottles. These are basically Coke and uh, other, <clears throat> uh, you know, just regular plastic water bottles, and then they make them into chips and then um, turn that into fiber and uh, then weave all of that into a fabric and then make different stuff like uh, cushion covers, rugs, bags. And so this is very eco-friendly because it's reusing, you know, all of these plastic water bottles. And then there are other things like jute. Jute is also a very eco-friendly material and there are a lot of suppliers that specialize in jute. And um, they've kind of... <clears throat> 
um, you know, jute is a very like uh, a very plain kind of material. It's just brown and, and a very rustic kind of material. But a lot of people are uh, using different dyes and prints and treating it with different uh, kinds of uh, finishes to um, to to make it look attractive and be usable in bags and other things. This is one factory over here that I thought was very interesting. So they make co organic cotton products and the entire factory runs on solar energy. Wow. So I thought that was very impressive because they're like, you know, taking the eco-friendly uh, thing to like an extreme level. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, of course, this is an exception. You know, there are not too many factories that do this, but I thought that was quite interesting. I mean, other factories also are trying to be eco-friendly, but I think this is one that's just taking it to the next level. These are some examples of the disposable plates that I was mentioning. And, and uh, I think now they're kind of getting um, a bit saturated on Amazon with a lot of sellers selling these plates. But um, yeah, I mean, earlier last year, I, I heard that there were literally containers of this stuff going out from India uh, on a weekly basis. So these are sugarcane waste disposable dinnerware and then areca leaf disposable dinnerware. Some kitchen items that I thought I would highlight and a lot of, you know, bar sets and other metal kind of products, jugs, um, a lot of cutting boards. Um, one of the things that Indian suppliers, I think, specialize in is mixed materials. So they, they use um, materials like maybe wood, marble and resin, you know, together in a cutting board, for example. And so they're very creative in, in those kinds of things. Um, and that's an advantage of making products, you know, by hand or handmade products. There, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of the uh, materials that you can combine together in a specific product. Um, these are some furnishings that I wanted to highlight. So this over here is actually, these are doormats made from coir. Now coir is a material that is made from coconut husk. It's a very unique material, very biodegradable and eco-friendly. And um, it's only produced in one city in India and there are a few different factories that do that. So this factory over here is actually one of IKEA's largest suppliers. And they produce hundreds and thousands of these door doormats and other products as well. Uh, but I thought these were really beautiful and they can you know, do different designs and finishes on them. And they can do this molded kind of finish as well. So I thought it was very interesting. Um, this is a cotton bath mat that is hand tufted. And this is mostly in the north of India in a city called Panipat hand knotted carpets again um, very popular from India and mostly done in the state of Kashmir in the north um, this is a recycled fabric area rug that I thought was very interesting so it's basically they're taking these uh, waste fabrics from factories and other places and then weaving them together with jute or some other material to make an area rug and I've seen these selling on Amazon as well all right, so I just want to talk a little bit about uh, some tips to source effectively from India. So one of the, let me just take a sip of water. Okay. Um, this is some, I mean, this is some really good information, just like what the variety of things that are available to be sourced from India, is, I think really a lot larger than I had even sort of, I had an understanding of, so this is good. Yeah, yeah, and um, I think many people don't realize that India is actually a very big exporter of, you know, of these kinds of products, but India has mostly been exporting to retailers and big box stores um, until now. And, and it's only now that Amazon sellers have kind of discovered right. all of these products. And <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that I find is that it's really important to build trust and relationships with, uh, with a supplier. And once you do that, you'll find that you get better terms, better priority treatment in terms of, you know, how they prioritize your orders. So a lot of the Indian suppliers, uh, I find that um, they, they work, uh, you know, in, in China, the transactions are very, I mean, the, the interactions are very transactional. So you say, okay, here's, here's your money and here's my order. And, you know, that's the end of it. But in India, I find that a lot of suppliers, they want, want to develop long-term relationships with the buyer and they want them to place, you know, repeat orders and, um, they go out of their way to help uh, buyers who they think, um, you know, are, are better prospects and they have, uh, they're more likely to place repeat orders. Because I find that a lot of Indian suppliers, they, um, they don't like to invest in getting, you know, new buyers all the time. They prefer to just have good relationships with the existing ones. I think that's 
you know, in, normally in business as well, you'd like to have that, right? Yeah, it's a lot more um, expensive to acquire a new customer than it is to keep exactly. a customer. So absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Totally agree. Um, and then, you know, work with your supplier as a partner. So this is, of course, applicable, you know, when you're working in China as well, especially if you're working with uh, a mid-sized kind of company, you know, uh, you can help improve their processes if, if you if you can suggest things for them to improve in their factory. And I find that Indian suppliers are very, um, you know, open to these kinds of suggestions and um, they, they kind of work very well with, with, the, with buyers that have these kinds of suggestions. Um, also, if you, if possible, visit the factory, you know, that's of course in China as well. Once you do that, then you're actually, um, you know, communicating to the factory that you're committed and that you are really, really serious about doing business. And also if you see, if you visit them at a trade show, you know, if you travel all the way to India and visit, uh, visit a trade show, they know that you are, you're serious and uh, they'll be more responsive to your inquiries and to your requests. Whereas, you know, if you're just reaching out to them online, they really don't know who you are and uh, you might find that it's uh, they, they don't reply that promptly um, to your email. But if you're visiting them at a trade show, whether it's in India or maybe another country as well, um, you know, they, they, they will tend to be more responsive. Also little things like, you know, wish them on festivals. There are just so many festivals in India. <laughs> and of course, depending on what religion your supplier is, you know, that's important too. There are a couple of different religions. There are Hindus and Muslims and Isha, different festivals. But, you know, uh, just be casual with them, ask them about their children, their families, and that's quite normal. And that's how you kind of build the relationship. Um, also, this is really important. Uh, make no assumptions when you're sourcing um, from India and also from China as well. But I think it's, it's more important in India, too, because a lot of times suppliers don't like to say no. And they will go out of their way to find a way to make whatever you want happen. For example, if you're looking for a certain product that the supplier cannot make in-house, they will go out and find a factory to do that, right? Um, but maybe that, you know, down the line that might cause issues because they don't have a lot of control on the materials and the processes and everything. So uh, if, for example, you want a certain product manufactured, make sure that you ask detailed questions about the supplier's capability to ensure that they can do that, pro that product in-house. Also get everything confirmed in writing as much as possible. Uh, and this is, of course, just good basic sourcing, um, you know, practice, whether you're sourcing from China or India. WhatsApp is more commonly used in India, whereas in China it's WeChat. So, uh, you know, the first thing you should do is send out an email with your request and then get them on WhatsApp as quickly as possible because um, especially if you want to do business with the supplier, you know, get them on WhatsApp so that you can get uh, responses for them uh, quicker. Of course, if you don't want to do business with a supplier, then don't get them on WhatsApp because then they'll be sending you messages. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is something that I've mentioned previously a little bit. So it's very important to vet your supplier and make sure that you're working with an export-focused company because a lot of the companies in India, they, they specialize or they target the domestic market as well. So you want to avoid those kinds of companies and make sure they have experience in your market, they specialize in your product, and of course, they're the right factory size. If you're just starting out and you know you don't have a very high order quantity, you don't want to work with a really big company that's working with you know Walmart or TJ Maxx or Anthropology or one of those stores. They are not going to you know be responsive to you or not prioritize your orders in front of their big customers. So work with a mid-sized kind of factory that's willing to grow with you. Everything is negotiable, and I really like this aspect about sourcing from India because. I find that suppliers are very flexible. So it's not only the price that you can negotiate. And when I say negotiate the price, I don't mean on your first order itself. You know, you ask them to, to cut the price by 50%. I don't think you should do that. I mean, it's a business and every everybody should, you know, be able to make money, including yourself. But I, th I find that once you start placing orders, you know, placing repeat orders, that's the time to negotiate. And... Um, Apart from price, there are a lot of other things that you can negotiate that will be that will affect your bottom line and you know help your help your profits overall. So for example, payments terms. This is something you'll find that Indian suppliers are very flexible to do, but only once they've built a relationship and trust with the buyer. Delivery lead times, packaging. You know, sometimes if you have a very fancy packaging or something, you can ask them to include the packaging in in the product cost. Maybe you can ask them to add some functions on the product without increasing the cost or features or be flexible on the MOQ. 
So I find that they are quite flexible and usually they'll come back to you with one thing and then you, know, you can always go back to them and negotiate um, on various aspects. Okay, so this is the last section, how to start sourcing from India. So the first thing that I just tell people to do is Google for suppliers. So whatever product name, whatever product you want to source, just type that into Google and export manufacturers India. And, um, you know, sometimes you'll come across websites of suppliers instantly, or at times you'll just see a lot of the supplier directories in search results. So you may have to go deeper into search results to find um, factories of actual suppliers. And, um, and then use supplier directories like Alibaba, Global Sources, and India Mart. So Alibaba and Global Sources are the more export-focused supplier directories. And most of the companies on both of these websites are, of course, Chinese manufacturers, but they do have suppliers from other countries. And what you need to do is basically, after you do a search, use the supplier location filter to look for companies from India and other countries as well. Now, India Mart is another uh, supplier listing directory. However, it's more India focused. There are manufacturers that do export, but there are also a lot of trading companies and wholesalers that cater to the domestic market. And in fact, they they have a lot of Chinese products over there as well, because you know there, there, there's a lot of demand for Chinese kind of products, the low, low cost Chinese products in the domestic market. So you'll find a lot of wholesalers, trading companies on India Mart that do that. So I tend to avoid India Mart as much as possible, but of course, it does have a lot of different companies. And if you're, if you can identify the exporters specifically, you know, from India Mart, then go for it. But otherwise, just be very wary. There are a lot of export promotion councils. These are government organizations that are tasked to improve exports in certain industries. So, for example, there's a leather export promotion council, jewelry, cotton, handicrafts. So you can do a search for uh, the industry that you're trying to source for and then the Export Promotion Council. Go to their website and sometimes they have exporter lists on their website just you know for free to download. And other times you might have to send them an email and ask them for an exporter list. Now their exporter list may be really long because it's maybe you know all the 3,000 members that are in their directory and sometimes the list does, is not very complete. They may not have all the information like the contact details or the product information so you will need to do a bit of research and you know dig deep into each company's uh you know do some google research and look at their website etc and talk to them on the phone but at least you have a list to start with and at least you know that these companies are exporters there are a lot of sourcing agents in india as well that you can work with and um in in my facebook group for example we have a few vetted sourcing agents that uh, that I have uh, you know, included in the group uh, as well. Typically, sourcing agents charge anywhere from 5 to 10%, and they manage the entire process for you, including looking for suppliers, uh, negotiating, placing orders, getting the sampling done, and even the final QC. So it can be very advantageous to use a sourcing agent, especially if you're sourcing in higher quantities and you want somebody to visit the factory um, you know, maybe during production and right before production and when the container is being uh, stuffed. So I think it really helps to do that instead of having to get, you know, $300 inspections done for, uh, for each of those uh, uh, processes. And then agents can also help facilitate your, your logistics and get your shipments done, but they are going to be working with freight forwarders separately. So, um, you know, you, can, you yourself can work with a separate freight forwarder uh, to manage all your few shipments. There's also a fair called Delhi Fair. It's actually, it was known as the Indian Handicrafts and Gifts Fair, but now they're kind of re renaming it to Delhi Fair. And um, this is also known as the Canton Fair of India. And there are a lot of, um, there are 4,000 export-focused suppliers at this fair. And this is the only 100% export-focused fair in India. There are a lot of other fairs as well, but they cater to the domestic market and also have exporters. So it's kind of a mix. But this is this is one that's 100% export focused. I really like this fair because all of the suppliers there have really good export experience and the products are, you know, export quality and, and uh, they understand how to work with buyers. So if you cannot visit the fair, I mean, ideally, of course, you'd want to visit the fair because you want to touch and feel the products and talk to suppliers face to face. But of course, that can't happen right now. But all of their exhibitors are online. So just do a Google search for Delhi Fair exhibitor list 
and you'll be able to find the exhibitors and you can download the list. And, you know, it's about 4,000, but they've categorized them by, uh, they've listed them by category. So you can download an Excel file for each category. So I think that's a good way to start as well. And is also, this information they are free? Is this, um, can anyone go and download the list of yeah, exporters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's totally free. Totally free, yeah. So again, this fair is held by a government organization, by one of the councils, in fact, the Export Promotion Council for Handicrafts. They host this fair. So it's yeah, completely free. And they're also hosting a virtual fair uh, July 14th. In fact, they've just finished their um, textiles virtual fair. And they also did a fashion accessories virtual fair. But that's those are just finished earlier this month. But then this bigger one is coming up in July. So take note of this. If you're interested in sourcing from India, then this is something to consider and you'll be able to um, you know, see and meet a lot of suppliers over there. The, I've, I attended their previous virtual uh, fair, which, was, which, just, which just happened this, earlier this month. It's a bit clunky and it's not as smooth as you know, any other website. But at least you have a list of suppliers, right? <laughs> something is better than nothing, I it's guess. A starting, I it's a starting point. It's a starting point, yeah. And I think a lot of these ex, uh, you know, exhibition organizers are starting to do these virtual fairs. It's the first time that a lot of them are doing these virtual fairs. So I think the technology will improve gradually. Like Canton Fair is also happening nowadays, right? The virtual mm -hmm. Canton right. Fair. But I, I, I think that people are not very happy by the technology and you know it's not very really smooth but you know you have access to suppliers you know that's right. a good thing how long has this delhi fair been going on oh it's been going on for a long time i would say like i don't know 24 25 years okay yeah so sort of the a first well time established I, um yes, fair yes. And a lot of people attended okay yeah yeah and it's been growing like the first time i attended it was probably in 2001 okay. and there were like i don't know maybe like 800 suppliers or even less it was a very small fair so it's sure. gradually grown and um yeah it's, it's pretty good it's very well organized very professional um and you know they, they cater to western buyers needs so for example they have lunch for everybody over there they, they offer free lunch to buyers when you're at the fair okay. and all the the, the food that they offer is, you know, very Western and not like the spicy Indian curries and all. <laughs> <laughs> Which are delicious. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so these are some resources in case someone's interested. So I have a free ebook where I talk about, uh, where I go into in-depth um, uh, into a, some of the things that I talked about over here. And I gave an overview of how uh, you know, how you can source products from India. So this is the URL, indiasourcingtrip.com forward slash ebook. I also have a Facebook group in case anyone's interested to join that. Uh, I do a lot of webinars in the group. Uh, I invite, you know, various experts. In fact, I've, I've recently started doing this um, show every month where I invite suppliers to do webinars in the group. It's called Virtual India Sourcing Show. And... Um, Basically, I have, you know, like five to 10 suppliers every month and I do live webinars with them. People can ask them questions and it's totally free for people to attend. Um, and, you know, it's just a good way to find suppliers uh, if, if you are looking to source from India. In fact, the next virtual show is happening this Friday and Saturday, right, so which is June 26, 27. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Uh, really quickly, I wanted to talk about this India sourcing trip that I organized. So this is basically an eight-day tour for e-commerce and Amazon sellers. And uh, it's a learning sourcing and cultural tour to India. And uh, we visit the Delhi Fair. In case anyone's interested, you know, you can get more information at indiasourcingtrip.com or send me an email at info at indiasourcingtrip.com. Uh, to get more information. And basically what we do at this fair is, um, at this trip is first of all, we host uh, a conference in India to teach people, you know, how to source products effectively from India. So we invite various experts to talk about things like negotiating, quality control, uh, logistics, and things like that. Then we also do guided tours at the trade show. We have sourcing coaches and we also have about 10 um or total 10 coaches. There are about five sourcing coaches, five e-commerce coaches that accompany the group. There's Tim Jordan, <laughs> who's one of the coaches as well. And uh, there, there are others. So we do debrief and mastermind sessions in the mornings and evenings during the trip. And then we also do some factory visits um, 
in and around Delhi. And then there's some cultural activities uh, included as well. So we visit the Taj Mahal, which is, of course, one of the seven wonders of the world. And uh, we also have a bit of cultural experience where we do um, a cultural program, like a very lively Indian dance. <laughs> uh, there's a special dance troupe that we invite to do that. And then people can, you know, wear Indian dresses and, you know, dance <laughs> to some Bollywood tunes <laughs> if they want. All right. So, yeah, that's the presentation, Hipa. That's excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I mean, that was a lot. That was very detailed. And I think what was the most interesting part was was really talking about what kinds of products are available in India and, and you know, sort of what to okay. expect, so what you're looking for in different categories. Um, so I think that was a really good takeaway from this. Um, and, you know, I, I love the fact that you – it seems that you have a relationship with a lot of these suppliers. You know them, you can connect them um, to people right now virtually, which is sort of how we're doing everything. Um, yes. but, but I think that that is really important is, you know, you vetted some people out, you vetted some agents out. Um, and so it's a really good stepping point to getting into something like this, you know, exploring India as a, 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 a option for sourcing. So thank you so much, Megla. I really appreciate you, you know, talking to us in, in, our, um, in our audience and um, so you know a lot of what you mentioned I'll go ahead and add that below and then um, uh, uh, that way folks can reach out to you directly and you, you, you can answer their questions but I think it almost seems like your Facebook group is that sort of the best way to get you and to get yes. information yes and, that's the best way perfect yes, absolutely. wonderful well Megla thank you so much I appreciate you uh, doing this for us thank you so much I really enjoyed it Eva wonderful <laughs>